In The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, best-selling author Robert Spencer chronicles the relationship between Muslims and Christians. He argues that modern Islamic terrorists share a similar ideology as other Muslims throughout history. From Politically Incorrect Guide Day 2007, this is 40 Minutes. Our next speaker on this fascinating day when we're uh, demolishing all kinds of politically correct uh, sayings that we hear in our country is Robert Spencer. He is the director of Jihad Watch and an adjunct fellow, fellow with the Free Congress Foundation. Uh, he has had many articles and med, had many appearances on television, and he is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam. Uh, please welcome Robert Spencer. I don't know if you've seen the news today. Salman Rushdie is in the news again. The uh, Pakistani British citizen novelist who is uh, in the news for just having been knighted by the Queen. There have been today, today of course is Friday. Friday is the day on which in Islam one goes to the mosque and hears a sermon. And today, evidently, all over Central Asia in uh, Salman Rushdie's native land and neighboring lands, there were sermons denouncing his being knighted and calling for action in retaliation, revenge. And so Muslims came out of the mosques and took to the streets and uh, called for blood, called for Rushdie to be shot dead, called for uh, retaliation against the British. And of course, all of this, as several uh, speakers in the Pakistani parliament and elsewhere have explained, it's all our fault. It's all the British crown's fault and the British government's fault for uh, giving this honor to Rushdie, who of course, if you uh, don't know, 17 years ago he wrote a novel that uh, contains a rather unflattering portrait of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. And this was considered to be blasphemous by the government of Iran at the time, and he was uh, given a death fatwa. A fatwa is a religious ruling. He was uh, condemned to death, and the Iranian government offered a bounty that anybody who killed him would be paid and rewarded by the Iranian government. Of course, he has never given anyone an opportunity to collect, but this bounty has been renewed several times, and the death fatwa, the death sentence on Rushdie's head, has been renewed several times over the years, including yesterday. This creates some very uncomfortable problems for the West and for the United States in particular, because we are in the position of aiding what many people believe in the Muslim world is a blasphemer, somebody who has offended against religious piety. And really, you know, Americans being a fundamentally religious people even to this day, for the most part, don't want to be in that kind of position and find that uncomfortable and tend to maybe even have a sympathetic response, especially since Salman Rushdie himself, having come West, having uh, been enriched in the West, having been lionized in the West, is nevertheless a, uh, just as much of a venomous critic of Western civilization as anyone in the Islamic world today. They think, how on earth can we defend somebody like this? And this comes to fundamental questions about what we're facing in the war on terror today and what it means for us as Americans and as inheritors of Western Judeo-Christian civilization. This is because this comes to the heart of fundamentally different ideas of what it means to be a human being standing before God and what the implications of that are. And a lot of this, not coincidentally, also connects to the Crusades. 
Bill Clinton, right after 9-11, said it was all because of the Crusades. The Islamic world was attacked in an unprovoked attack. In 1099, the Crusaders sacked Jerusalem with unbelievable brutality. Memories are long in the Islamic world. They still tell those stories about the Crusaders massacring people knee-deep in blood in the streets. And this is why they hate us. It's all our fault. We provoked them in the Crusades and have continued to provoke them through colonialism and so on, all the way down to the present day. And this is why we had 9-11. And this is why we have rioters in the streets today all over Central Asia, because of this action by the British government. Now, two fundamentally different ideas of the human person and of that person's responsibility before God. All of this has to do with that because in the Islamic world the idea of God, the idea of Allah in Islam is that of what would we, we would term a dictator. Those of you who are coming, which I assume is the overwhelming majority of you coming out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, think of God as Father and are used to the idea that a religion will teach fundamentally the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the idea that one must be charitable to one's neighbor. People assume this to a tremendous degree, even today in our post-Christian society, people assume that anything that goes by the name of a religion must teach universal love, universal benevolence and charity. That is not the case. In the Islamic religion, if you read the Quran, the holy book of Islam, if you read the life of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and if you study the history of Islam, you will find again and again, all the way through all the sacred texts of Islam, and all the way through Islamic history and culture, you find a very sharp division between the believers and the unbelievers. The believers are the ones who are blessed. The believers are the ones who are favored. The unbelievers have no standing whatsoever no dignity as human persons, no obligation to love them, no obligation to be good to them, no obligation toward them whatsoever. As a matter of fact, you have a responsibility, according to the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29, you can check, check up on me on that, the responsibility to wage war against the unbelievers, particularly against Jews and Christians who are referenced in that verse, in order to subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law, which in this view is considered the law of God. Now, what does this have to do with the Crusades, and what does this have to do with Salman Rushdie? Everything. The Crusades were presented by Bill Clinton, by many others, even to, you know, you hear this all the time. You can probably turn on the television and hear somebody saying it today, as the beginning of the suspicion and hostility between the Islamic world and the non-Islamic world. Actually, the Crusades were a late and small-scale defensive response to 450 years of warfare waged by the Islamic world against non-Muslims in order to fulfill the imperative preached by the Quran and by Muhammad to subjugate the unbelievers under the rule of Islamic law, not to force them to convert. That's a very common misconception. Not to make them, compel them to be Muslims, but to subjugate them as second-class citizens. Non-Muslims do not, under the teachings of, under the traditional holdings of Islamic law, they do not enjoy equality of rights with Muslims. They do not enjoy full citizenship status. They have to pay a special tax. They have to accept a, a, a large number of humiliating and discriminatory regulations that make sure that they feel themselves subdued, which is what is mandated in the Quran in that same verse, 929. Now, 450 years of warfare the Islamic armies came out of Arabia. Muhammad died in 632. Almost immediately, the Islamic armies began to pour out of Arabia into the neighboring lands. Were those lands Muslim? No, of course not. They were Christians. They had been, uh, that was over half of Christendom, and they had been Christian lands for 600 years. Syria, Egypt, all of North Africa, Lebanon, some of the greatest saints of the Christian tradition. Athanasius, the author of the Nicene Creed, the uh, St. Augustine, John Chrysostom, they come from what is now considered to be the Islamic world. They come from the Middle East and North Africa. These lands were conquered, the Christians were subjugated, they were subjected to such 
discriminatory practices that the only thing that they could do to gain a, de a decent life, to be able to live a life with some measure of dignity, was to convert to Islam. And then suddenly all this discrimination would cease, the taxes would go away, you know that's a good incentive. A lot of people converted. It took many hundreds of years, but ultimately lands that had been 99% Christian are now today 99% Muslim and considered to be the heart of the Islamic world. This began in the 630s. By 1095, when the first crusade was called by Pope Urban, they had conquered a huge expanse of land stretching from Spain all the way across North Africa, up into Eastern Europe, and all the way across to India. And it was all in line with this imperative and this idea, this understanding that the non-Muslims did not enjoy any right to rule or any right to live in peace and harmony with, as equals with the Muslims. Now, <clears throat> the Crusades then made some attempt, a small attempt for 200 years, between 1095 and 1291, to stop that but not even really to stop that directly, that was just an indirect effect of it, but to protect Christians in the Holy Land, and there were small Christian principalities set up in the Holy Land for this purpose. Certainly the Crusaders were not sinless, no one is. Certainly the Crusaders did some things that cannot be excused, that's absolutely true. But the idea that the Western world bears the historical guilt for provoking the Islamic world in this way is absolutely historically false. The Crusades ultimately failed but they did stop the Islamic advance into Europe, the jihad advance into Europe for 200, those 200 years, which may have made the difference between a completely conquered and Islamized Europe and a Europe that became the repository and the birthplace for Western civilization. So, in the scheme of the, the Islamic scheme, the Islamic understanding of Mankind, man is the slave of Allah. You are only entitled to paradise if you are a Muslim, and if you, the, actually the only guarantee of paradise is to those who slay and are slain for Allah, those who fight in these wars that are sanctioned by the Islamic religion, and those who prevail in them or are killed. And if you're killed, then there's the promise. Chapter 9, verse 111 of the Quran promises paradise to those who kill and are killed for Allah, which is the rationale behind suicide bombing today. Now, this is not an idea, obviously, of free people. This is not a vision that is conducive to freedom. In the Christian scheme of things, however, freedom is absolutely fundamental. The Islamic world criticizes the West today for being libertine, for allowing things like blasphemy, like Salman Rushdie, for even rewarding the blasphemer by knighting him. This comes from the idea that is rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition that you cannot properly love and serve God unless you are free to do so. If you were not free, if you were a slave, if you have to do what he says because you are forced, and if you don't, then you, get the, the, you, you are subjugated or condemned to hell or both. On the other hand, you have this Christian idea that you are only properly serving God if you are free not to do so. But if you are free not to do so, you have to be genuinely free not to do so. And that means that some people will be evil. Some people will choose evil. We do not accept the evil, we do not agree with the evil, we do not approve of the evil, but as the, as the Lord Jesus in the New Testament says, you allow the tares to grow with the wheat until the end of the world. They grow together because if you uproot the one, then you meant risk uprooting the other. Now, this means that freedom is essential. The freedom to be evil is essential to the ability to be good. The freedom to do right, the ability to do right, the ability to choose what is good, absolutely requires the ability to choose what is evil or it's hollow. Now this is a fundamentally different idea from the idea that you enforce these things through threats and fear and punishment. 
but this is the idea in Islamic law. So in Islamic law, you have the idea that if the thief is caught, you amputate the hand of the thief. The adulterers are stoned to death. The fundamental difference, I think, is summed up there, and that's where I will end up and take some questions. In the Gospels, in John chapter 753, starting there and going to 811, Jesus is confronted by some of the Pharisees, and they have this woman who's been caught in adultery. And he tells them, of course, let the one of you who is without sin throw the first stone at her. Because after all, the law says she should be stoned. There's a, a parallel story. Muhammad is approached by a woman who confesses to him that she committed adultery. And he says, okay, go away and find out if you are pregnant or not. So she does. And she comes back a little while later, a few weeks later, and says, I am pregnant. And he says, okay, go away till the child's born. And so she comes back when the child's born and says, here, the child's born. Okay, go away until the child's weaned. So she comes back when the child's weaned, and he orders her stoned to death, and she is stoned, duly stoned to death. And this is held up as an example of how wise and merciful he is because he allowed the child to be born before enforcing the law. Now, the, the, you see the, 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 the key difference between those things. We may, not, we may not like what the woman did in either story. We may not approve of it, but to be merciful to her is not to approve of what she did. Now, that's the same principle here. I don't know if I'm articulating this very well today, but Salman Rushdie is not a very likable character. And we may not like blasphemy at all, but ultimately having Salman Rushdie's in the world, if not knighting them, is the price to pay for a society in which it is possible to develop genuine virtue and to be genuinely good rather than to only be submitting to coercion, as is mandated by Islamic law. This was the struggle that engulfed the Middle East during the Crusades. This was the struggle that Europe has been fighting for centuries, fighting off the Islamic warriors who are intending to bring this coercive system this coercive society and impose it upon them. That, of course, is again a challenge in Europe, and it's very likely that we're going to see it play out with increasing bloodshed over the next few decades, since Europe, with incredible short-sightedness, has been allowing Muslim immigration in huge numbers without any kind of screening or questioning or consideration at all of the possibility that the Muslims who are coming into Europe may want to remake society into the image of Islamic society. Yet, of course, that is, since Islam is and always has been, a political and social system as well as an individual religious faith, that is something that should have been considered, something that could have been considered had the Europeans been mindful of the history notably the history of the Crusades and what provoked them, and of the teachings of the Islamic faith. Now one final word, it is often said that if you speak about the fact that Islamic law is coercive and that it requires the subjugation of non-Muslims and that it teaches warfare against unbelievers, people will often say, well, you can't say that, you must hate them if you say that. And, you know, that's the, the, really, it's, I mean, people say this to me all the time, but it's, I still can't get over it. It's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And when people say it to you, you should respond accordingly. That what Islam teaches and what Islam has done is a matter of fact. These things are verifiable. You can read the Quran, and I encourage you to do so, and see what it actually says, and read the life of Muhammad, and see what, it is, what, what he actually did, and inform yourselves. It is not, the facts are not hateful or loving, they're just what they are. And then we have to deal with them. Unfortunately today, the political discourse about Islam, jihad, the war on terror, is dominated by, not by facts, but by fictions, by fictions that we tell ourselves because they're comforting and the reality is too difficult to contemplate. I don't think the situation is hopeless, but I do think that it will rapidly be so until, unless we quickly regain the courage to deal with facts that are unpleasant. Thank you.
Go away. I'm sure the questions are lining up. All right, I'll go to it. When you talk about the Islamic world, are you taking into account the different Muslim cultures around the world, such as, such as those represented in Jordan, Israel, the United States, Iraq, Turkey, etc., and their varying views of interpretation on the Quran, which in effect changes the ideologies of those certain groups and cultures? Well, sure, that's a very huge question, but there are several considerations we can have about it. Um, there are obviously these immigrant communities all over the world. There is no country where there are no Muslims. And so when I speak about the Islamic world, I do mean to include them, yes. And uh, this is, there are several considerations about this. One is there are varying interpretations of the Quran and there are varying interpretations of Islamic law. There are actually four schools of Sunni Muslim jurisprudence. The Sunnis are 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide and they are mostly the ones in the countries that you mentioned. I believe Jordan, Israel, the United States, Mo and where? Turkey. Turkey. Yeah, most of the, most overwhelmingly Sunni populations. There are four schools of uh, Islamic law for Sunnis, and most every Sunni Muslim adheres to the view of Islam, the understanding of the Quran that is taught by one of these, one or the other of these schools, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali. Now, each one of those schools is, it, they all agree that it is part of the responsibility of the Islamic Ummah, the community, which is not just a set of nations, but is anybody who identifies himself as a Muslim, collectively, wherever he may be. It is part of the responsibility of the Muslim community to wage war against unbelievers in order to either convert them to Islam or subjugate them as inferiors under the rule of Islamic law. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, taught that you first invite Muslims to invite non-Muslims to convert. If they refuse that, then you invite them to accept the second class status, the dhimma, the contract of protection. And third, if they refuse both of those to go to war with them. These things are taught by all four Sunni schools as well as by the Shiites. So on that, there's no disagreement. Now, does that mean that every Muslim in the world is pursuing this? Certainly not. Uh, it's, there's a spectrum of belief, knowledge, and fervor among Muslims as there is among any community that identifies itself by any name. And certainly if you consider yourself Christians or Jews or Hindus or Buddhists, that really doesn't tell us anything much more about what you actually think about things than we knew before. Because there are so many different ways, so many different levels of knowledge, levels of understanding, levels of commitment among people who, who identify themselves by those terms. So there's a remarkable variation in that regard, but on the other hand, a remarkable unanimity in terms of the, te the teachings themselves. And that makes the peaceful Muslims a, an ever fertile recruiting ground for the more radicalized ones because they're able to point to chapter and verse and say, this is your responsibility as a believer. You have to do this. And they're able to convince people that way. This happened in several notable cases in the United States where very nominal believers were approached by jihadist recruiters who were able to convince them on the basis of the texts of the Quran and Islamic law and tradition that this was part of their religious responsibility. And so I think that uh, while it is true there are many interpretations and people in many states in life, we have to realistically understand that this is, there is no community, I should say, that I should emphasize that there's no sect of Islam that is considered orthodox by the rest that has ever renounced the ideology of violent jihad or the subjugation of non-Muslims. And until that happens, these things can always be used to incite people to violence as they're being used today. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you just answered part of my question, but I was just going to ask you to comment on the issue of interpretation. And sometimes we hear that, yes, you can go find certain verses in the Quran that yeah. teach one thing, but it's just a certain group of people interpret that radically, just like yeah. there may be verses in the Bible which taken out of context could teach something totally different than Christians practice. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's very important to understand that anything, you know, any text can be interpreted any way anybody wants, really. But we need to be aware of how Muslims themselves have interpreted it. In the Quran, very briefly, the, there are two major divisions of the Quran. That is the Meccan verses and the Medinan verses. Muhammad started out in Mecca. He taught tolerance and peace, generally. And later he moved to Medina, another city in Arabia. He became, for the first time, a military leader, as well as a prophet. And he began to teach warfare against unbelievers. Now, 
if you read the Muslim commentaries, the prim principal Muslim commentaries on the Quran, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Juzai, the Tafsir al-Jalalain, As-Suyuti, uh, as including the 20th century uh, jihad theorists like Sayyid Qutb and Maududi and others, you will find that they will generally say that the Medinan verses, because they come later, take precedence over and cancel out what comes earlier. This is bad news for non-Muslims because unfortunately the violent parts are all in the later part of the book, chronologically. But the understanding is that where there is a disagreement, the, what comes later chronologically cancels what's earlier, and that therefore warfare against unbelievers is the Quran's last word on jihad. This is the mainstream Islamic understanding of this. I can give you plenty of references for this. Uh, actually, you can find them in the book and elsewhere. Yes, sir. How do you feel on the use of the term Islamo-fascism to describe certain methods of terrorism? I have no problem with it. Uh, certainly, there's a great kind of fascist element to this in terms of directing all of the energies of the group toward one particular goal and one end, and also, of course, the aspects of militarism and so on. I prefer personally to call the jihadists what they call themselves, which is mujahideen, jihadists, warriors of jihad. Jihad means struggle in Arabic. There are many struggles in Arabic, just as there are in English. You can struggle to quit smoking, or you can struggle against fascism. But <coughs> jihad, jihad in the mainstream Islamic texts, in the core Islamic texts, always has fundamentally meant warfare against unbelievers. This is what they call themselves, this is what they say they're doing. I think we need to start there and understand that it's not only up to us to define the terms of the conflict, but to understand how they see it also. And that will lead to better ways to deal with them and to meet the challenge that they present. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a quick two-part <coughs> question. Do you believe that it's only a matter of time before Sharia law spreads through Europe? And secondly, is the government doing anything now to monitor mosques that might be preaching hate against America and Jews? It's only a matter of time before Sharia law spreads through Europe, but it's also only a matter of time before Europeans realize what that means. And I think that we are much more likely to see civil wars in several Western European countries within the next two or three decades before we see Sharia law implemented without a struggle. But Europeans generally are not aware of what that means because they're being lied to, because the politically correct orthodoxy in this is that Islam is a religion of peace that has no political component. And so we just fundamentally assume that the people in Europe are not going to be trying to impose it. Is the United States, are American authorities trying to monitor mosques? I hope so. However, a few years back when the uh, word got out that the FBI was just counting, counting mosques, in various American cities, not monitoring what was going on inside them, but counting them. There was a huge hue and cry from the American Muslim advocacy groups and they stopped. So, you know, here again, political correctness is strangling our response to this. We have all kinds of evidence. The Center for Religious Freedom a few years ago published a report of what was being taught in American mosques and they found incredible hateful material about Jews and Christians and teaching about just what I'm explaining to you about the Islamic imperative to impose Islamic law on the non-Muslims and that being taught as being something that would just be a matter of time for America. Taught in American mosques, but nothing's been done about it. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering what your uh, thoughts might be on mm -hmm. um, Israel and the, the threats that it might face in the near future, especially if the U.S. starts to um, back away a little bit more from supportive of it. Of it. Here again, I believe that we can learn a great deal and formulate policy more effectively if we understand what the motives and goals are of the enemy. And the uh, Islamic resistance movement, which is, goes by the name Hamas, which is an acronym for that, Islamic resistance movement in Israel, has made its motives and goals abundantly clear in its charter, which it has never amended or rescinded since it was first issued in 1988. And it calls for the destruction of Israel. Israel will rise and remain erect until Islam obliterates it, as it did in the past. This is a quote, that's the epigraph of the Hamas charter. It's a quote from Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, the first modern Islamic terrorist organization. That is what they are about. That is what they are after. They will not accept land for peace. They will not offer peace for land. They will only accept concessions on the part of the West as an impetus to move more, f more, more forthrightly and more strongly to press forward toward that goal of the total destruction of Israel. 
Israel is one of the several front lines of the global jihad today. And if we were dealing with this problem on that basis, dealing with resisting this ideology, this totalitarian and expansionist ideology, wherever it is found, then we would not be e even remotely considering backing away from Israel, but strengthening our commitment to Israel. Earlier this year, I had a course in school on world religions, and it had a sort of politically correct stance to it with the idea that... What a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> we heard that the Crusades were completely unprovoked offensive wars and such. And one <laughs> thing that I heard that I was wondering if there was any accuracy to it all was that the country with the most Muslims in it is not in the Middle East, and that it's Indonesia. And that's I was right. okay. That's true. Oh yeah. Okay. Then why do we have the idea usually that Islam is all in the Middle East? I don't know. I mean, that's just false. People use the terms Arab and Muslim synonymously. Most Muslims today are not Arabs, and uh, the largest population is Indonesia. Second is in India, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Those are all non-Arab countries. Um, th it's important to understand this is not, I mean, I think that that's something that clouds the issue here, actually, because people think of it as a racial thing, and that if you oppose Muslim immigration, you must be a racist. It's not about race at all. It's about this ideology that is inimical to the U.S. Constitution in numerous ways. We ought to be dealing with it on the ideological level. Um, this morning in the New York Times, there was a front page article with a picture of a woman with just her eyes showing um, with the full black niqab on. And the headline read that this was a test of British tolerance. And I was wondering if you could comment, because I know that there have been issues um, that have been raised in the United States with women who want to go take their driver's license pictures with a hijab on or just their eyes showing. Yeah. Um, I think the New York Times is, is skewed in their picture of British society, and I think the British will concede and give more and more to the Islamic community um, in Britain. But how do you see that um, with the United States? Well, it's coming. I mean, obviously, you're right. There was a push in Florida and in Texas also for people to be able to be completely covered in their driver's license picture, which is absurd on the face of it or on the whatever of it. The, uh, the Saudi Arabia doesn't even allow that. You know, you, you can't take go entirely covered up and get a driver's license. I mean, of course, women can't drive, so that doesn't come up. But for identification, for identification purposes, you have to you have to show your face. You know, what's common sense in one place is 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 uh, is a political struggle in another. There are increasing efforts. I mean, we just saw that in Kansas City, uh, they put in a taxpayer expense foot baths into the uh, airport for the Muslim cab drivers. And they said, oh, well, see, this is not religious. It's, it, it certainly is religious. In Islamic law, you want to pray those prayers five times a day. You have to do various ablutions before you pray. You can't pray before washing. And one of the things you have to wash is your feet. The foot baths that were installed in the Kansas City airport are exactly the same foot baths you will find in mosques. They are not used for anything else. And there is no other, you know, when, how many times have you been going through an airport and think, I really want to wash my feet? <laughs> and so there are increasing efforts on the basis of spurious appeals to civil rights to introduce Sharia provisions into the United States. And this is something that we're completely clueless about because nobody even understands that they are Sharia provisions or what the implications of allowing them are. I don't hear any discussion on this, apart from the fact that the first thing Bush did after 9-11 was fly to the communist superpower, Red China. But what, to what extent um, do you think that this uh, attempt to get us to submit to coercion is, is a use of the Muslims, both past, present, and future, either by the Soviet communists or the Red Chinese communists, or the Soci uh, Socialist International, basically to use them as a tool for world uh, socialist communist domination. People have tried to use Muslims in, in, for their own political purposes throughout history. One of the stories that I tell in this book is about the Byzantine Emperor John VI Cantacuzenes, who made an alliance with the Ottoman Sultan in a dynastic dispute. He was fighting with his cousin, I believe it was, for the imperial throne. He, got, he invited the, uh, the Turks into Europe to defeat his rival. And they stayed in Europe. They've been there now for 600 some years. He thought that he was going to be able to control them. He thought that he was going to be able to use them for a limited purpose. And they ended up destroying his empire. 
anybody who thinks that they can use the Islamic Ummah worldwide for their own political purposes has always had a rude awakening. And I believe that if the Chinese, if the Russians are doing that, and certainly the Chinese have been playing, uh, so have the Russians, have been uh, arming countries uh, in the Middle East and Muslim countries around the Middle East, but they will come to regret that because the imperative to subjugate the non-believer does not end if one is aided by that non-believer. The non-believer is just making it easier. I want to ask you a question. Um, about any danger that we have from the Muslim mosques in this country and also about the political impact because I remember seeing on television after the 2000 election a gathering and I don't know who it was a gathering of but they were bragging that the Muslims in Florida had practically unanimously voted for George Bush which of course would have been enough votes to have carried Florida and we all know that carrying Florida meant who was president. Uh, are they allies of George Bush? What is the, what is the political impact? And uh, do we need to worry about dangers from the mosques? Uh, we do need to worry about dangers from the mosques. This is not a political advertisement, but the governor of Massachusetts, Romney, a few years back, recommended that the mosques be monitored. And this was an eminently sensible suggestion for which he was received widespread abuse and he's never repeated it. But I wish he would, or that the rest of them would pick it up also. Because we don't, there's no distinction. There is no, as I said before, there's no Islamic group that has excommunicated, pronounced takfir upon Osama bin Laden, or has said that if you believe in jihad and the subjugation of non-Muslims, then you're an unbeliever, then you cannot be in this mosque. You cannot go down the street and you see Baptist church and a Methodist church, but you can't go down the street and see extremist mosque and moderate mosque. They're all mixed up together. And so we don't know where jihad terrorists are working, but we know that they're working in mosques and we have precedent that they're working in American mosques. Every mosque ought to be monitored as a result of that, unless and until the American Muslim community begins to show, not just in words, but in actual deeds, that they are not allowing this material to be preached in their mosques, but they're not doing that. And you're right, yes, there is a voting block. It's not as large as it had been thought. The Council on American Islamic Relations and others have been saying there's six or seven million Muslims in the United States. They're not. They're only about 2.3 million. Uh, as are they voting Republican or no, Democratic? No, they were voting Republican, but after 9-11, they've been voting overwhelmingly Democratic and voting as a bloc, and they are li very likely to continue to do so. All right. Well, thank you, Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer is a fellow with the Free Congress Foundation. This event was part of Politically Incorrect Guide Day 2007, sponsored by the Eagle Forum. For more, visit eagleforum.org.